It's the Daily 304's presentation of famous people, places, and events that shaped West Virginia. Welcome to the History Project. Today we take a look at The Abolition of Slavery in West Virginia in the Civil War, Part 4. American slavery started on the coasts of Virginia in 1611, ingratiating itself into the South's economy and building tremendous wealth for Virginia's plantation owners in the Tidewater and Piedmont regions. This, in turn, gave them additional political clout over the residents of the Mountain and Trans-Allegheny regions. In 1861, Eastern Virginia had 472,000 enslaved people, 30% of its population. By contrast, Western Virginia had 18,000, 5% of its population. Regardless of this disparity, the only acceptable number for enslavement is, of course, zero. So West Virginia had to reckon with its own role in slavery. Western Virginia was represented by senators in Washington under the aegis of the restored government of Virginia. Both men, Waitman T. Willie of Morgantown and John S. Carlisle of Clarksburg, were slaveholders and they argued against the immediate end of slavery in Union loyal regions. Regardless of what appears to be self-serving advice, Lincoln did exclude the border states, Delaware, Maryland, Kentucky, and Missouri, from the immediate actions of the Emancipation Proclamation when it was implemented in January 1863, for fear those states would join the Confederacy. This provision later applied to West Virginia when it became a state in June of that year. Statehood, however, enabled West Virginia to take the reins of the issue. The Emancipation Proclamation was transformed into the 13th Amendment, and the West Virginia Legislature ratified it February 3, 1865, among a set of states that were the third to do so and two months before the war ended, meaning that the new state's newly minted motto, Mountaineers are always free, was true for all, as it should always have been.